it's really oh, being recorded. Okay, continue. Um, it's 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 wonderful to be able to talk to you at such long distance so easily from my living room. Um, so let me begin. So this is a joint work with Shohei Nakamura, who was formerly in Tokyo, um, but now is in Osaka. Um, so it's to do with how um, the Fourier extension operator interacts with um, particularly the X-ray transform. And I think you've had some, well, I know you've had some lectures from Keith Rogers on restriction theory and, and the Kakea problem recently. So um, I guess I'll draw on, on, on that background knowledge a little bit um, in places. Um, so what do I mean by tomography bounds for the Fourier extension operator? Well, the Fourier extension operator is a certain oscillatory integral operator. Um, and what I mean by tomography bounds, I mean bounds on um, various sections of the extension operator. So tomographic transforms such as the X-ray transform and the Radon transform, they just calculate integrals on affine subspaces of different, of different dimensions. Um, and this gives us some, some data and we can um, analyze that data. And it turns out that, that doing so um, has some applications um, to, to the weighted theory um, of, of Fourier extension operators. So um, the weighted side of, of Fourier restriction theory that, that Keith um, talked about. Okay, so there's a, there's a bit of a history to this, well, not a great deal. Let me see if I can get this to move. Um, right, okay. So the keyboard's not working. There. Anyway. Um, so there's a bit of history to this, and it goes back to some work of Planchon and Vega just over 10 years ago. Um, so they were looking at solutions to the, the free Schrodinger equation. Um, so this is in, in d, d spatial dimensions. So you use a solution to, to this equation. And um, they were interested in. Um, among other things, um, new ways to prove Strickart's estimates um, for solutions to the Schrodinger equation. And somewhere in their analysis, uh, expressions such as this cropped up. So here, this script R is, is the Radon transform, the classical Radon transform. So I've, I've got it written here. So the Radon transform takes a function on RD and it integrates it over a certain affine subspace. So R of F is a function of, of um, of, of hyperplanes, and we're parameterizing hyperplanes here by their normal vector omega and their distance s from the origin. So this, this is the role of this delta distribution here, which um, gives rise to integration over, over this hyperplane with normal omega and distance s from the origin. So this, this Radon transform is applied to the modulus squared of the solution, but only in a spatial variable. So if, fixing T here, and we're computing this, this Radon transform of this modulus squared of the solution. And then there's a certain derivative that crops up, and this is just differentiation with respect to this translation parameter in this family of, of hyperplanes. And so this gives rise to a function of, of the hyperplanes parameterized by, as I say, by the normal vector and the translation parameter S. And then an L2 norm is taken in this translation parameter. Okay, so I claim this naturally crops up um, in, well, in their work, and it came from looking at certain um, monotonicity properties or, or more accurately convexity properties of what are called Morowitz interaction functionals. Um, so this, this um, goes back to work of Koliande, Kiel, Staffelani, Takoka, and Tao. Um, so Morowitz interaction functionals, um, generally speaking, take this form. So this is a, a certain um, weighted L2 norm of the solution to the Schrodinger equation, except it's a, a weighted L2 norm of, of the solution tensor itself. So this is U tensor U in L2 with respect to some weight, um, phi. Now, if, if phi is identically one, this of course is just the L2 norm, spatial L2 norm raised to a power. And so this is conserved. Now, what's, what's interesting in, in the context of um, what's interesting about these, these so-called Morowitz interaction functionals is that if you take phi to be other things, perhaps phi's which have um, some singularities in them, um, rather than having preservation of quantities like this, um, one finds monotonicity or um, more accurately convexity properties. 
Um, so here, um, in particular, they were looking at the case where phi has a certain um, singularity in its derivative on the hyperplane perpendicular to the direction omega. Um, and in calculating two derivatives of this quantity, looking for convexity properties, this quantity here involving the Radon transform naturally crops up. Um, so it's sort of curious on one level, um, but it turns out that actually you can, um, you can use estimates on expressions like one to prove, um, give new proofs, PDE proofs of some familiar strict arts inequalities. So strict arts inequalities that we, we would ordinarily prove using oscillatory integral methods. So for example, if D is three, so I'm in three spatial dimensions, it's not difficult to see that if I integrate this expression one with respect to the remaining variables, so integrate with respect to the angle omega and also time, I pick up exactly the L spatial, sorry, the space time L4 norm raised to the power four of the solution. So understanding one um, provides us with a way of accessing strict arts estimates. And, and so I guess the message I'm trying to, to get at here is that in the world of strict arts estimates, these sorts of tomographic expressions are quite natural and quite useful. So here I'm, I'm taking slices, if you like, spatial slices of mod u squared, or I'm taking uh, the L2 norm of the solution on, on um, affine hyperplanes or on, on hyperplanes um, in RD. And that, that's a natural thing to be doing. That's, that's what I'm claiming. And so that's really where they, they um, as far as I can tell, um, um, but where the Radon transform or, or sort of tomography bounds, if you like, in the context of oscillatory integrals um, first cropped up. Um, and before I come on to what I really want to talk about, let me just give a little bit of further evidence that, that the Radon transform and, and this um, modulus squared of the solution interact quite naturally. Um, so here's a, here's a theorem that, that we proved a little while ago with Neil Bez, Taron Flock, Susana Gutierrez and Marina Iliopoulou. Um, this was for two spatial dimensions. Uh, it turns out that this, this combination of the Radon transform and the modulus squared of the solution in the spatial variable, um, it's natural in the sense that there is a, a sharp L2 to L3 bound for this composition. And it's, it's sharp in the sense that this is the sharp constant and there's, there's equality if and only if this initial data, U0 is the initial data, if it's a Gaussian function. And so this speaks again to, to some sort of um, natural interaction between um, these, the slicing operation of which is the Radon transform and the modulus squared of the solution to the Schrodinger equation, this oscillatory integral here. Okay, so um, moving on, uh, I guess I, I, if, if there are any questions, please don't hesitate to stop me. Um, you can put something in the chat. I've got the chat open up here if that's helpful. Um, so what I really want to talk about is, is motivated by that work of Planchard and Vega ultimately. Um, and it's really to explore um, how th this, this idea of, of, of studying slices um, can be used in the context of Fourier restriction theory and in particular understanding better the so-called Fourier extension operator. So you, you don't have to have understood or, 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 or been convinced rather by my first two slides to, um, to, um, to move on from here. So there are two parts to the talk. So the first is, is as I say, slicing the extension operator using, um, first of all, the Radon transform, and then we'll move on to the X-ray transform. So I'll make some observations about that and, and show you some bounds that, that you can prove. Um, part two, I'll describe some applications to, to some existing problems in restriction theory um, and hopefully um, show that or, or, or give the impression that this is a, it's a natural thing to do to be taking such slices. Okay, so uh, before I go on, there is a, there's a related paper of, of David Beltran and Luis Vega um, on the archive from a couple of years ago um, where they look at K-plane transforms and they take more of a PDE perspective, um, but it's closely related. And if you're interested in this, 
in this business, that's something else that uh, you should look at. Um, okay, so Fourier restriction theory, what is that? Let me just spend a slide um, recalling um, the basic questions and ideas from Fourier restriction theory. So Fourier restriction theory is about understanding um, the decay properties of Fourier transforms of measures, effectively, where these measures are supported, typically supported on curved submanifolds of Rn. So, I mean, the simplest, um, interesting thing perhaps you might say, um, or, or yeah, is, is, is the following. So, if if I if I'm in Rn and I'm and I have a I have surface measure d sigma on the unit sphere in Rn, then it's well known. But the Fourier transform of this surface measure, so this surface measure viewed as a singular measure on Rn, has this decay rate at infinity. So it decays like mod psi to the minus n minus one over two. Now, so obviously this is some quantitative understanding of the Fourier transform of, of a surface carried measure. Um, and it's it's, it's very much at the heart of the theory of restriction theory that this decay is largely due to the presence of, or largely due to the non-vanishing curvature of the unit sphere. Now, if I were to consider a, a less regular measure on the unit sphere, say, say I had some LP density um, on the unit sphere, um, then this decay rate fails rather badly, but it's conjectured that it continues to hold at least in an LP sense. So here's the restriction conjecture, which says, instead of looking at d sigma hat, where d sigma is surface measure on the sphere, I'll look at g d sigma hat. So I'm, I'm giving it a, an LP density. Okay, so it's a rough, um, it is a rough measure, um, has a rough density on, on the sphere. And I take the Fourier transform of that, and this should land in, in LQ if G is in LP, if and only if these conditions hold. And there is a certain endpoint estimate which just fails, um, modulo and epsilon loss here, um, that this, this operation mapping G to G D sigma hat should be bounded on L2N over N minus one. And here, let me just clarify, BR is, is, a, is a ball of large radius R, and we're allowing some blow up um, of the order of R to the epsilon for any epsilon positive in that truncation parameter. So the constant here is, is implicitly uh, depending on epsilon. Um, so perhaps if, if, this, if this stuff is, is new to any of you, um, one can at first reading um, ignore these truncations and so on. Now this mapping G maps to G D sigma hat is called the extension operator. And I'd like to just um, emphasize my pen. Um, this is a, an oscillatory integral operator. Of course, this is the uh, Fourier transform of a measure. And of course, here, you see the definition of the Fourier transform of a measure e to the i x dot psi d sigma of psi. Okay, so this is an operator we're looking at bounds on. Um, it's very much an oscillatory integral operator. Um, Clear that. So let me move on. So one quick comment before I do. Um, having some technical problems. Um, if Q happens to be even, so if there's some L2 structure here on the left-hand side, so if, if Q is, for example, four, then this L4 norm is really the L2 norm of of the modulus of g d sigma hat squared, then we can remove the oscillation from the left-hand side just by Planchard's theorem. Right, the, L, the left-hand side just becomes this L two norm of a convolution, and so this becomes um, relatively um, simple um, with the oscillation removed. And these these observations um, where there's L two structure on the left, they go back to um, to work of Pfefferman from the seventies. Um, it has a long history. Okay, so that's a sort of relevant comment for what I'm about to come to. So, um, so I suppose one of the one of the sort of unfortunate, arguably things about the restriction conjecture is that the critical exponent 
is away from two, right? I've, I've just I've just um, commented here that when there's L2 structure on the left, um, things are somewhat more tractable. So it's sort of unfortunate this problem is formulated in such a way that it doesn't have L2 structure at the interesting place. And apart from when n is two, this is four, isn't it? And that's, of course, due to the fact that this decay, um, the critical LP space for this, for this decay is L2n over n minus one, right? Raise this decay rate, this decay here, this power function to the power 2n over n minus one, and we get something that's critically um, not integrable. Um, so maybe we could try and reformulate or state a uh, or, or somehow capture some of the, of the content of Stein's restriction conjecture, um, but keeping the L2 structure. Um, so here goes. Um, well, as I say, that this, this decay rate of the sigma hat suggests that this particular um, Lebesgue space is critical when we integrate on the whole of Rn. But if we integrate just on a hyperplane, then L2 becomes critical, doesn't it, right? Um, if I raise this to the power two, it becomes critically um, non-integrable on, on subspaces of dimension n minus one, that's to say hyperplanes. So from the point of view of um, keeping L2 in the picture, it's natural to restrict G sigma hat, the extension operator to hyperplanes and consider uh, estimates on those. So that suggests, I claim, looking at the Radon transform of, of mod G D sigma hat squared, um, or um, for reasons of integrability, reasons of finiteness rather, um, a similar thing, but where we have a cutoff here. So this is the characteristic function of, of some large ball of radius R. And the idea is that we tolerate, um, we tolerate a small amount of growth, what is effectively logarithmic in that truncation parameter. Uh, and otherwise, this this I mean this just generally isn't finite, even with g being identically one because of this this fact. Okay, but again, on first sight, I think one, one can overlook this technical aspect of, of truncating here to to create finiteness. So this is just the Radon transform I described before. Omega is the normal to this um, hyperplane to our hyperplane, and s is its s is its s is its distance from the origin. Okay, so I think from an integrability point of view and, and a critical Lebesgue exponent point of view, these are reasonably natural things to look at. I mean, it turns out that um, it turns out that there are some rather simple formulas for for these compositions. This composition of of this Radon transform with this extension operator, um, and it's really rather elementary and really just boils down to Plancherel's theorem. So it turns out that the Radon transform R here, it doesn't distinguish between mod G D sigma hat squared and a certain manifestly um, non-oscillatory object, right? G D sigma hat is, is an oscillatory integral, okay? And here what I'm looking at on the right is something manifestly not oscillatory. So I should say what X zero is. So X zero is, is the X-ray transform restricted to lines through the origin, okay? So here, the X-ray transform takes a function f on Rn, um, takes a direction omega, and it integrates with the function f on the line through the origin with direction omega. Right? So this is a form of restricted X-ray transform. And X0 star is just the adjoint. And I've noted what the adjoint of this restricted X-ray transform is. It's just this evaluation map um, with this weight factor and this um, Antipodal symmetry aspect. So um, the Radon transform, as I say, doesn't distinguish between these two things, which I, I thought was rather striking. Um, and actually, I can tell you what the Radon transform is of either of these two things rather, rather easily. And this is a um, simple theorem. Uh, let me just skip to part one without reading the top bit. Um, so part one is telling me that the Radon transform acting on mod GD sigma hat is the same as the Radon transform acting on this adjoint restricted X-ray transform of mod G squared. And that they are um, equal to some, some operator T0 acting on mod G squared. 
And I should tell you what T0 is. So T0 is, is given by this expression here. So T0 takes a function on the sphere and it provides a new function on the sphere. And it, it is a certain, um, it has a flavor of, of, of the fractional integral on the sphere, except it has the critical power, which means this kernel is not integrable. Hence the presence of this um, delta here. Delta, the presence of delta here is, is to make this kernel integrable and to make this operator um, meaningful. Um, but of course, if the support of F is such that X dot omega never vanishes, then this does actually make sense. So that there is a finiteness issue in these expressions, which, which um, is reflected in, in um, the fact that this is infinite, this integral expression is infinite if um, X dot omega can be zero on the support of F. And so for that reason, part two here um, brings in this cutoff function and estimates um, the Radon transform of mod GD sigma hat squared in terms of one of these T deltas. And you can see how um, the scale delta equals one over R is the natural scale associated with this level of truncation. But from the point of view, as I say, from the point of view of, of sort of a, a, a first exposure to this, uh, one, one might imagine that, that uh, delta is zero and that one is not carrying a truncation parameter here. Okay, so this is very easily proved and it is really, it's really just Planchorel's theorem. And I've just written the proof here in two lines. I mean, the main point here is that, that um, locally the sphere looks like um, a hyperplane. Okay. And when I take the Radon transform, I'm restricting GD sigma hat to, a, to a, another hyperplane. And so since the extension operator is, is a Fourier transform and I'm taking um, an L2 norm over this hyperplane, I can apply Planchorel's theorem on that hyperplane. Okay, and, and one just has to parameterize um, a portion of, uh, will parameterize the, the sphere by a patch of Rn minus one, upon which one can write the extension operator as the N minus one dimensional Fourier transform of something. And you see these, these strange square root factors come from parameterizing the sphere by a patch, a patch of Rn minus one. Okay, so it really is just a quick exercise to verify these identities. So there's nothing very deep here, other than the fact that it, it's, it's man I think it's, it seems to be a natural object to look at um, in the context of the extension operator, right, the, these, these um, hyperplane integrals. And so, well, um, it is a very simple object, this composition of the Radon transform with this quadratic extension operator, where one can look to estimate it in various ways. Um, so here is a here is um, essentially a characterization of all of the, the possible the big space bounds for this composition, and again you, you see the role of the cutoff is there just to provide finiteness. Um, so one can estimate these things if one wants um, in, in the usual scales of LP spaces, um, and, and ultimately what it boils down to is estimating um, something that we call, something that's called the spherical Radon transform. So bringing in this Radon transform on Rn um, and applying it to mod GD sigma hat squared naturally gives rise to something called the spherical Radon transform. And this is what I'm calling A sub S, sometimes called the Funk transform. And this is, is, is the same as the Radon transform, except I'm integrating over the sphere instead of Rn, and my measure is a Lebesgue measure on the sphere rather than on Rn. So this takes a function, function on the sphere, um, and it computes um, integrals over, over circles on the sphere, I'm using my head as a sphere. Um, so if S is zero, these circles are great circles or great spheres if we're in high dimensions. And so that this is the spherical Radon transform naturally crops up um, if you look at this composition here. And it turns out that to prove these, these estimates, um, which turn out to be sharp in various ways, um, what you need are uniform estimates in these spherical Radon transforms. So estimates that are uniform in this, in this parameter S. So S, is, S um, tells you, um, so you imagine you've got the, the unit sphere, 
and you're intersecting it with a hyperplane for distance s from the origin. And so for s equals zero, these, um, this intersection is going to give rise to great spheres. And for s equals one, it's just going to give rise to a single point. Right, the sphere will intersect a hyperplane at a single point if that hyperplane is a distance one from the origin. So um, you know, the scope for some degeneracy here as s approaches um, as, s, as s approaches one or s approaches zero. Um, and it turns out that you can prove um, it's not too difficult to prove uniform estimates on these spherical radon transforms in this in this um, distance parameter s. Um, and actually, um, matters improving this theorem matters boil down to proving um, an ln over n minus one to ln bound on this spherical radon transform that I've got again put up here, which is uniform in this uh, in this um, distance parameter s. So this was this was known um, in the in the mid eighties through work of of Mike Christ um, for s equals zero um, in the in the case of the the classical spherical radon transform or funk transform. Um, and also for in, in dimensions at most three, um, um, Chris also proved some uniform estimates in, in this S parameter as well. But it turns out that you can, um, sorry, turns out that you can, um, you can prove um, estimates, this estimate with a certain uniformity in this parameter S using the, um, the modern theory of radon-like transforms, and in particular, um, results involving uh, the notion of non-vanishing rotational curvature. Uh, there's a there's a, a lemma in Tau Vargas Vega um, from '98, which which you can apply um, in a fairly straightforward way to establish these uniform spherical radon transform estimates. Um, now you might ask, um, what what are what do these estimates mean? How should I think about them? Well, let's just look at the corresponding endpoint estimates for the composition of the radon transform with mod gd sigma hat squared. So I've just lifted this from the previous theorem, and it's the endpoint estimate that corresponds to this endpoint spherical radon transform estimate. And um, actually, you can understand, one can understand this um, as a consequence essentially of the restriction conjecture. If you knew the restriction conjecture, then you could apply um, a known endpoint estimate for, or near endpoint estimate for the radon transform of Obel and Stein. First of all, apply a radon transform estimate. Um, then apply the restriction conjecture and you would essentially get this. Okay, you wouldn't pick up the logarithmic bound here, but you'd pick up an R to the epsilon for each epsilon positive. So it's consistent with the restriction conjecture um, but of course, we would need the restriction conjecture to prove it um, in that way. So somehow we're really exploiting an interaction between the radon transform and the extension operator, a really important interaction here, um, which, is, which is making this um, so much more transparent than the restriction conjecture. Okay, so you might think, well, perhaps there's not a huge amount to um, restricting, um, looking at these L2 norms of the extension operator on hyperplanes. Um, and perhaps that's right. Um, th these operators I've been telling you about are, are relatively straightforward. Um, but it, I think it turns out to be quite a bit more interesting if you look at line integrals instead. So if you look at the X-ray transform instead of the Radon transform. And so that's what I really want to talk about. Uh, I want to talk about what happens if you take um, L2 norms of GD sigma hat along lines um, using, of course, the X-ray transform. Now, it's not a priori clear that L2 norms or the exponent, Lebesgue exponent two is the right one in the context of lines. Remember, we motivated um, L2 being critical in the context of hyperplanes because indeed the example um, d sigma hat decaying like mod psi to the minus n minus one over two was critical for L2 integrability on hyperplanes, but it's no longer critical for an L2 integrability on lines. Okay, so one might begin by thinking about how the X-ray transform acts on mod GD sigma hat to the alpha for various alphas. And I should say a couple of words about 
parameterizations of lines. So this is the X-ray transform, the classical X-ray transform on Rn. And it's, it gives me a function of lines. So it simply integrates the function f along a line, giving rise to a function on lines. And we're parameterizing lines by their direction omega and their position v. Now v naturally belongs in the orthogonal complement of omega, right? So the line has direction omega and v is a translation parameter or position parameter which lies in, which is, um, lies in the uh, subspace perpendicular or the hyperplane um, with normal omega. Okay, so that's a natural parameterization of lines. Um, so I think the critical exponent is less clear now. And remember, we, our naive approach to looking for a critical exponent was to consider this case, little g being identically one. And if we're to integrate on lines, we'll take L, LP norms on lines, I guess it's L alpha norms now, isn't it? L alpha norms on lines, then alpha should be two over n minus one, right? Because then raising this to the two over n minus one will give me a decay uh, mod psi to the minus one, which is critically non-integrable. Um, it's, it, it's, it's almost in L1, sorry, it's almost yeah, critically non-integrable, right? So this is almost in L2 over n minus one of lines. So perhaps one might seek to understand the X-ray transform composed with GD sigma hat to this particular power. And of course, the problem there is that this power gets very small for large n and is only two when n is two. And certainly for n at least three, it's, it's, it's dipped quite quickly, dips quite quickly below two. And so that makes it difficult to analyze and somehow perhaps defeats the purpose of all of this business, which was really about trying to bring L2 back into the picture um, in, a, in an explicit way. Okay. So I don't have much to say about that, again, because this is a rather difficult object to analyze, but there are some conjectural estimates, which I think might be of some interest because they relate to um, other well-known conjectures, and in particular, the restriction and Kakea conjectures. So um, let me tell you about how um, things link up. Um, this particular combination of the X-ray transform and the extension operator link up with the Kakea conjecture. So the Kakea, Kakea conjecture concerns the Kakea maximal operator, which I've stated here. So the Kakea maximal operator is defined as follows. I, I take a function f on Rn, and I take a direction omega. So omega lives on the unit sphere. And I consider um, line segments t, and I compute the average of f over those line segments. And now I take the supremum of these averages over all line segments which have direction omega, right? And this gives me a function of omega. Now in practice, we don't take line segments, we take slight thickenings of line segments, which explains this parameter r here that I've included. So here, um, t is a one over r neighborhood of a unit line segment, um, and, and t stands for tube, which is the standard terminology here. And the Kakea conjecture says that this maximal operator is essentially bounded on Ln, modulo possibly um, a, a, a bound of the form, uh, a factor of the form r to the epsilon for each epsilon positive. Um, so it's known in two dimensions and famously due to Cordoba. In higher dimensions, there's been lots of progress on this, along with the restriction conjecture. I think um, Keith Rogers will have told you um, a fair bit about that, I expect. Um, now, the Kakea conjecture is, is of particular interest to us, of course, as harmonic analysts, in that it, it relates to the restriction conjecture that I've stated already. So in particular, the restriction conjecture implies the Kakea conjecture. So there's, a, there's an upward implication here. Now, from the, from the harmonic analyst point of view, understanding the, the Kakea problem, is important because um, over the years and, and since the work of Borgan from, from the early 90s, we've been devising cleverer and cleverer ways to, to effectively reverse this implication. So in other words, to use um, our understanding of Kakea type problems to make progress on restriction. So there is, there's definitely a, an interest and a sort of pressing interest to understand how these two conjectures are, 
are really related. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. Uh, but at this point, I just want to point out that, that um, there is a conjecture actually that sits in between these two. Um, and it's this one, um, which I'm calling restriction Kakea hybrid. Um, so this one, so this one implies Kakea and is implied by restriction. So you know, perhaps it's perhaps it's interesting to, to, to have this um, stop off point in trying to understand the relation between the two. Um, but what is this? So this is the, the this um, composition of the X-ray transform with this particular power of the extension operator that I've been telling you about with this um, supposedly critical exponent that we discussed on the previous slide. And here I'm taking the supremum over, um, I'm, I'm, so this is a function of lines, of course, the X-ray transform of this function gives me a function of lines, and I'm taking the supremum over all lines with a given direction omega. So this is very much like the Kakea maximal function, isn't it? So this soup of X here is really interchangeable with this Kakea maximal function, um, effectively. Okay, the, here I genuinely am integrating on lines. Here, this, this involves tubes. Um, but for one reason or another, um, in this context, that, that's, not, um, that's not significant. I mean, essentially amounts to the fact that GD sigma hat is, is essentially constant at scale one. Um, GD sigma being a, being a compactly supported measure, so GD sigma hat um, is, is essentially constant at, the, at, at scale one as well um, by uncertainty principle considerations. So this is effectively the Kakea maximal operator applied to a certain power of the extension operator. And this is the conjecture bound. So one can go from restriction to this um, simply by observing that restriction implies Kakea. So we can first of all apply the Kakea conjecture to remove this um, supremum applied to X, right? We apply this conjecture here to remove this. And what we're left with on the right when we've applied it is a certain norm of GD sigma hat upon which we may apply the restriction conjecture to complete. Um, and, and the the implication of Kakea from this restriction Kakea hybrid is, is, is one of the standard um, Radomacher function randomization type arguments um, that uh, I think people are probably reasonably familiar with. Okay, so I want to move on from there. Um, so as I say, I, I, I have nothing to say about, about this particular conjecture. And, and the main problem here analytically is that this power is not two. And I just really want to bring things back to L2. Uh, somehow I think that's the sort of the, the real point of, of this whole business is that um, it's bringing L2 back into the picture. Um, so actually it turns out I claim that, that L2 line integrals are also natural. So looking at the composition of the X-ray transform with mod GD sigma hat squared, so these are computing L2 line integrals, is also a natural thing to do, despite the fact that arguably um, two is not critical for computing line integrals of this expression. One of the advantages is that I don't have to put in this truncation parameter. This expression is, is generally finite, um, and so these are genuine um, integrals on, on full doubly infinite lines. And motivated by, um, I guess, the, the previous slide, we're going to look at L infinity in the translation parameter. So I'm effectively applying the Kakea maximal function to mod GD sigma hat squared here. And I'm looking for bounds on that composition. And this theorem is saying that actually that's a natural, that, that's a natural, it's natural to, to look at that composition and that they interact with each other in, a, in, in interesting ways. Um, so actually, um, I'm stating this for n is three only because that's the dimension in which we could settle the whole question. And so there's an if and only if characterization here in terms of the Lebesgue exponents. Um, so maybe that doesn't tell you too much, but let me make a remark, a remark or two. Um, it's not a very difficult, theorem to prove particularly, and it relies on a, a rather curious 
um, connection with the spherical radon transform that I mentioned previously. So it turns out that this Kakea maximal function applied to mod g d sigma hat squared is bounded by a certain square function expression or certain quadratic expression involving the spherical radon transform, where I will now consider um, spherical radon transforms um, involving all possible um, distances s. So when s is zero, these, this, this computes, as I say, integrals over great spheres, all the way up to s is plus or minus one, where it is effectively a point of valuation at, at the uh, antipodal points, at, 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 the, at the poles, if you like. Um, so, so this is rather straightforward to, to show. And actually, it, it's true with equality if g is non-negative. So this is quite a, there's not much lost here. And, and really that it's this L infinity norm in the translation parameter that's really responsible for this being um, relatively elementary, I think. Um, but this does capture some estimates that really don't follow from the restriction conjecture. So one example is Q equals infinity. So Q equals infinity fits into this range. So if Q is infinity, then um, the optimal P would be two. Okay, so if I'm taking Q is infinity, then I'm, I'm just taking um, the supremum of the X-ray transform of mod G D sigma hat squared. So I'm computing an L2 norm of G D sigma hat along a line, and I'm looking for a uniform bound on that uniform in my choice of line. And it turns out there is a uniform bound and it's simply bounded by the L2 norm squared of G. And that's certainly something that doesn't follow from the restriction conjecture. Um, the restriction conjecture just tells us that G D sigma hat belongs to a certain LP space. And the X-ray transform does not map LP into L infinity for any, for any P. One can always find an LP function with a very, very high ridge upon which um, the X-ray transform is infinite. Okay. So, uh, I, I, so yeah. uh, what happens if, if you multiply it with the characteristic function of the ball uh, at, at this, uh, the points where, uh, you know, this, this fails, do you get some logarithm? Well, uh, yeah, I think, I, think, I think you probably would, thinking about it. I mean, there, there is a logarithmic counterexample here. I expect you would, although, I'd, yeah, I'd need to check. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good point. I think, I think you're probably right. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Um, okay, so I want to, so I've told you a bit about, uh, hopefully I've convinced you that there's some natural interaction between these tomographic transforms and the extension operator, particularly, um, when interactions, when, when one has this quadratic structure. Um, and, and the beauty of that is somehow it's bringing um, L2 firmly into the picture. Um, and, and allows us to use L2 ortho, you know, elementary L2 orthogonality um, devices such as, as Poincharel's theorem. Um, it, it sort of opens up that. Um, really rather elementary classical techniques um, wh while saying, saying some, some new things. What about applications? What, what possible use could these observations be? Um, so here's a, here's a conjecture, one of my favorite conjectures in, in, in restriction theory. And it, it, it's, a, um, it's attributed to Mitsuhata and Takeuchi um, a paper of theirs in the 80s. Um, so it, it claims that if I want a weighted L2 norm of GD sigma hat, I want to control that. So I've got a non-negative locally integrable function W. So this is just a standard weight function. Then that is controlled by the L infinity norm of the X-ray transform of the weight times the L2 norm squared of, of the function G. Okay, so a very simple statement. Um, this is wide open, even when n is two, unlike the restriction conjecture, which is known for n is two, which goes back to the 70s work of um, Stein and Pfefferman. Um, so this looks like a good candidate, partly because it has the X-ray transform explicitly in it, partly because it has some L2 structure here, despite the fact that this weight can be very, very rough. Um, before I 
move on to how I might approach this, let's um, let's just recall a, or, or just note a certain local version of this, which is often referred to as Stein's conjecture, although there are manifestations of questions very much like this in work of Pfefferman and Cordoba from, from the 70s. Um, this also originates um, from a paper of Stein's from the 70s. So Stein's conjecture is a local version of this in the sense that instead of having um, a Lebesgue, Le Lebesgue measure in the L2 norm on the right, I have a certain weight. And this weight depends on, on the weight on the left. And it's the, the obvious thing you'd guess um, so that this implies the Mitsueta Taguchi conjecture by pulling this weight factor out in L infinity. So here I'm taking a partial supremum, if you like, rather than this full supremum. I'll take the supremum only in, in, the, in the position parameter or the translation parameter of the line. So again, this is effectively the Kikea maximal function applied to the weight. So it, it retains a dependence on, on the angle omega. But if I pull the L infinity norm, pull this out in L infinity with respect to omega, of course I get a full L infinity norm of X-ray transform of the weight and this L2 norm squared with respect to the Bayes measure. So you can see how it's clearly stronger than the Mitsuata Takeuchi conjecture. Now, a critical feature of this of this two-weighted conjecture is that it, it, it captures, or it, it, in, in conjectural form, it captures um, it, it captures a, a very clear link. Uh, I should, I, mean, I should emphasize it's a conjecture between the Kakea conjecture and the restriction conjecture. So in particular, if we, if we knew this Stein's conjecture and we knew the Kakea conjecture, we would have the restriction conjecture. And you can see this in effectively a couple of lines. The restriction conjecture wants us to control this particular expression on GD sigma hat. And just by duality, I can write it um, like this. So W here is serving the, the role of some duality pairing. Um, and then if I apply Stein's conjecture here inside the supremum, right, and then I apply Helder's inequality with suitable exponents so that this particular LP norm of G comes out, then um, this remaining factor may effectively be controlled using um, the Kakea conjecture. One can make this rigorous rather easily, although it's not rigorous as, as stated. The point is, um, it's sort of two lines away from saying that Kakea implies restriction. Uh, and it, it's striking because the left-hand side involves an oscillatory integral and the right-hand side really doesn't. The right-hand side um, only involves two positive geometrically defined expressions. And so it has a flavor of Kakea implies restriction in itself um, in that Kakea is something positive and combinatorial and restriction is something oscillatory. Okay, so these conjectures are known for radial weights um, that, 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 and, and weights with certain other structures as well. Um, and that goes back to work in the 90s of Cabri Soria and Barcelo Ruiz and Vega. Um, and also there are some results of this type like Stein's conjecture, but where the maximal function is something worse. So some, some weaker versions of Stein, Stein's conjecture are known. Um, due to these authors, um, most recently Lee, Rogers and Seeger. Um, but, but the maximal functions that arise there, um, again, it's in two, well, um, it's not in two dimensions. The maximal functions that arise there um, are somewhat deficient um, in terms of how, they don't give you the Kakeo replies restriction, of course, we still don't know that um, that, that implication. But still, um, progress in this direction from, from a couple of angles is, is sort of slowly ongoing. Okay, so how, how might I approach um, these two conjectures using um, these tomography bounds that I've been talking about? Um, how might I bring in the X-ray transform onto the left-hand side? Well, the idea is to use the inversion formula for the X-ray transform. Um, and here I've written the inversion formula. So the X-ray transform has a left inverse. It's, it's uh, one derivative with respect to the translation parameter or the position parameter of the line. Right? Remember the lines are parameterized by the direction omega 
and the translation parameter or position parameter um, V lying in the orthogonal complement of omega. And so to recover the function F, you have to first of all take one derivative with respect to that um, position parameter, and then you take the adjoint x-ray transform. And up to a constant, this recovers your function, at least for suit suitably well-behaved functions. Anyway, in the context of, of integrals, one perhaps doesn't, well, well, one doesn't have to worry too much about the sense in which this holds. Uh, but if one naively applies this with f being mod gd sigma hat squared, I can simply plug, um, plug in here in front of gd sigma hat squared, this expression x star derivative in vx, right, which is effectively the identity. And if I do that, I can then throw the x star onto the weight using a duality, and there it is. Okay, so this is a, a true statement. And here I'm, this is this is the inner product on um, inner product on L2 of the manifold of lines, if you like. So x of w is a function of lines. So this is um, all parameterized by lines. Okay, so this looks good because I've got the x-ray transform of the weight cropping up. Um, I'm for time. Um, right, I'm running out of time fast. Uh, you uh, can but, take some more time if you want, that's fine, yeah. Should I aim for half past? Um, hang on, aim for the hour because I'm, I'm, I'm at uh, half an hour out of phase with you, aren't I? I should perhaps aim for six o'clock with you, isn't it? Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, okay. Oh, uh, yeah, I'll, I won't be too long now. So this is good from the point of view of the conjecture. Let me remind you of the conjecture. It has the x-ray transform of the weight in it, either of these conjectures. So the very fact that we've written the left-hand side explicitly in terms of that seems very promising. Now, if I want the L-infinity norm of this, I should, I should simply apply Helder's inequality. So here I'm applying Helder's inequality with exponents infinity in one, um, only in the V parameter, right? So this, this integral in omega um, is part of this inner product. And I've taken the supremum in V of this term in the second slot, and I've taken the L1 norm of the term in the first slot in the parameter V, and that's, that's what I've done here. So I've done something really elementary, just, um, held as inequality in the V parameter. So this sort of has a flavor of Stein's conjecture, at least as far as we've got this Kakea type maximal operator sitting there acting on the weight. Although we'd like this to be mod G of omega squared. Um, anyway, we can go a stage further and pull this completely out in L infinity, right? And then we genuinely get the L infinity norm of the X-ray transform. And then we have some L1 norm um, of some L1 norm in both V and omega. And the nice thing about this, of course, is that this is the sort of expression, broadly speaking, that we were looking at earlier. Um, interactions between X-ray transform and this um, GD sigma hat um, with this quadratic structure. So these L2 line integrals are featuring here. And so we understand this reasonably well, arguably, and, and actually well enough to spot that actually this isn't going to work. Um, turns out that this is typically infinite. Even when g is identically one, this is just infinite. So this is far too crude. Um, so this doesn't work. Um, but this has an, enough redeeming features that it should be telling us something. Um, and indeed it does. So this doesn't work, but maybe I could be a little, a little um, more forgiving in places. Um, so here was my first line from before. So instead of pulling this out in L infinity, let me redistribute these derivatives a bit. So the real problem with the expression on the last slide here was that there are too many derivatives here. The X-ray transform of mod GD sigma hat squared doesn't have the regularity, this much regularity. It doesn't tolerate a whole derivative. But it'll tolerate fewer derivatives. So I'm going to I'm going to give some derivatives to the X-ray transform of the weight. I'll divide them up. And so Q is just some parameter I'm using to divide up, um, to, to just to distribute these derivatives. Um, and now I'm going to apply Helder's inequality, but not with L1 and L infinity. And I'll, I'll choose my 
Helder exponents so that the resulting um, expression involving the weight scales like the Kakea maximal function. Okay. Um, and so let me do that. So these, these are analogs of similar lines on the previous slide. So if you take Q to be um, infinity here, this is what I was doing before, right? There were no, no derivatives here. This is the L infinity norm of the X-ray transform. And this would be an L1 norm as it was on the previous slide. So the question becomes, can I prove um, estimates of the type I'd like, at least for some Q finite, um, giving rise to um, variants of, um, perhaps hopefully some interesting variants at least of uh, the Mitsuata, Takeuchi and Stein's conjectures? And the answer to this is yes. Um, and um, Q equals two, perhaps wouldn't surprise you, is um, turns out to be a, a good place to look. And at least when n is two, that's somehow the threshold for, for this to work out. So when Q is two, um, I'm finding myself looking at L2 norms again. Um, so things become much more computationally viable. Um, so let me just skip, um, skip through this slide a little bit. So this is a statement of a certain, what I call Sobolev-Stein inequality, um, where the Kakea maximal function is replaced with a certain um, L2, the supremum in the maximal function is replaced by a certain L2 Sobolev norm. And the L2 Sobolev norm um, from a scaling point of view is equivalent to the L infinity norm. So this is half a derivative in L2 of the line since I'm in two dimensions, which is um, from a scaling point of view, um, the same as the L infinity norm. Um, same as the Kakea maximal function. Um, let me um, just finish up now. Uh, perhaps I should just go straight to the corollary because it's it's the simplest thing to look at. So this is what you might call a Sobolev Mitsuata Takeuchi inequality, where one doesn't have the L infinity norm of the X-ray transform of weight, but one has, um, as I say, something that scales in the same way. Um, the soup in V is replaced by half a derivative in L2, um, which is the sort of natural Sobolev um, numerology um, associated with, with um, the L infinity norm. And there's some, there's some logarithmic loss here, unfortunately, uh, which I think is actually there. I think you can remove this if you um, raise the number of derivatives by epsilon here. Um, anyway, th there, there is some loss in, in, in some respect. Here. So I guess um, the moral of the story is um, that perhaps the real moral of the story comes from looking at the inversion formula. I can write mod GD sigma hat squared in terms of um, the X ray transform applied to mod GD sigma hat squared. And the X ray transform applied to mod GD sigma hat squared computes. Um, L2 norms on lines. And I can understand those L2 norms on lines using Plancherel's theorem. So I get to access the oscillation, uh, orthogonality rather, um, sort of classical L2 orthogonality um, via that. And um, this gives me a representation for my extension operator, which has already accessed that um, sort of classical L2 orthogonality on all of these um, lines in Rn. Um, and that in, in certain contexts, um, this, this representation can be useful. And I think these two conjectures perhaps are prime examples of how, where they might be useful. Although clearly there's some, um, there's some way to go to, to figure out what's really happening with these conjectures and, and whether these methods um, or perspectives can really um, form part of the, the final story. Okay, so I should stop talking. I've, I've uh, Definitely talk to them. Okay, uh, thanks a lot for a really nice lecture. So, uh, are there any questions? Uh, hello, hello, Professor. Uh, hello. This is Saurav. So, I was just wondering, like, uh, when you prove uh, these estimates, they involve uh, radon transform and the X-ray transform. 
are there also results where uh, you use k plane transform instead of yes there are um yeah um so that i i referred you to a paper of beltran and vega on the archive 2019 so they they more they, they do this quite explicitly in some contexts uh, yes. but yes it, it's clear that um the ideas there's similar ideas on both ends and they, they, they inevitably have some uh, so a particular design. choice of uh, k k plane uh, does it also give you the the inversion formula for example i mean is there uh, something like that yeah so there's an inversion formula for all of these all of these okay. yeah okay. thank you thank you very much mm -hmm. okay And uh, so, so what I, well, uh, so from some part which you presented, so I understood that when you take the X-ray transform, it sort of uh, gives you better inequalities than from directly using uh, the restriction or because of the square or? Well, I think it's just different. It can access information that the restriction conjecture can't because, but then, you know, it, I'm not saying it's, I'm certainly not saying it's better, uh, it's different. Um, mm -hmm. So the restriction conjecture takes a global LP norm on Rn. Um, if I take an X-ray transform, I'm, I'm, I'm probing the geometric structure of my function in a different way. I mean, it's quite a blunt tool to take a, a global LP norm. If, if I can understand um, LP norms on, on affine subspaces of different dimensions, it's, it's giving me some different information. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And, yeah. and as an application, I mean, you get an inversion formula and then you can prove some, some more inequalities, uh, weighted sort of. Uh, yeah, so yeah. those are the ones we went for, but if you look at, um, of this work of Planchon and Vega and, and Beltran and Vega, they do use this idea to reconstruct a certain expression from knowledge of, of these sections for, you know, take uh, via the Radon transform or, or K-plane transforms. They, uh, they do use that in, in other contexts, so in particular proving certain Strickart's estimates for solutions to the Schrodinger equation. But generally, the, the, the idea, the naive idea, is, is simply um, looking at these, these K-plane transforms applied to uh, the modulus squared of, a, of an oscillatory integral um, is going to allow us to access um, L2 orthogonality via Planchet-Rel's theorem on all of these affine subspaces. And then um, if we've got... Um, you know, if if we then bring the inversion formula in, then we can um, then we can uh, harness that information and apply it to various situations. And and I think some situations are more suitable than others for this. Um, so, for example, I don't see that I I don't see that this is a particularly viable approach to proving the restriction conjecture, for instance. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, I don't see. I wouldn't claim that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah. Once again, thanks a lot for uh, really a nice exposition to this. Uh, so, if there are no further questions, uh, let's thank the speaker. So, thank you very much. You can, you can clap, uh, when, uh, unmute and clap. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, so uh, I'll end the uh, meeting here. So is it okay if I post the recording online? Uh, yes, it's, fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye.